seats we have our keynote speaker, Trisha. Clink the glasses, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just give it another minute. We got people rushing back to their chairs. And thank you, everyone. Glad you're having a fun afternoon. More networking to come after. So please hope you will join us on the patio for a glass of wine to celebrate. So I want to remind you, that little ticket that you got, that red ticket, everybody keep that handy because at, after uh, Trisha speaks, we're going to do our door prize drawing and you don't want to miss the lovely pieces of Annie glass. Okay, so hopefully everybody got a ticket, right? Because if you didn't, we will get you one. Okay. So Trisha Montavo Tin is not just an accomplished board director, venture investor, speaker, author, and diversity champion. She's an, someone who embodies our theme, Own the Journey. As a first generation Latina, she navigated the complex landscape of Silicon Valley, offering her exp expertise to both tech giants and startups. Her remarkable journey reached its apex with the $2.6 billion sale of Looker to Google. Yeah. But her commitment goes beyond the boardroom. Trisha is a tireless advocate for women and girls providing mentorship and investments to female founded companies. Her accolades are well deserved, including the 2020 Women of Influence and Latino Business Leadership Awards and a spot on the 50 women to watch for boards in 2023. <laughs> In her latest book, Embrace the Power of You, Trisha imparts her wisdom, inspiring those who've ever felt like outsiders at work to embrace their authentic selves and attain success. Her presence today, here today is a testament to her commitment to inspiring and uplifting others. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to our closing speaker, Trisha Montalvo. Okay, let's switch this one. Yeah, I'm in my 50s too, so I need these guys. <laughs> So thank you, Chris, uh, Amy, the Chamber, for inviting me here today. I am so thrilled to be in this room with such amazing women and a few good men. <laughs> <laughs> and it nicely coincides with Hispanic Heritage Month. As Chris mentioned, I'm a first-generation Latina. So I genuinely believe in the power of storytelling. So my remarks today are in the format of my story. So here we go. My heart, it's racing so fast, I'm sure everybody can see it beating out of my body. I practice my relaxation techniques. Close my eyes, take three deep breaths. I enter the stairwell on my way to the conference room to present in front of hundreds of my colleagues at Looker. I start thinking to myself, why did I suggest this? Share my story in front of everyone at the company? What was I thinking? Alone on that stairwell, I stop and I pause. Another deep breath. And I remember a quote from the poet Maya Angelou. I may come as one, but I stand as 10,000. 
You may feel alone, I remind myself, but I stand as 10,000. I arrive in that conference room and I watch all of our employees gather and I smile. You know that fake smile like, oh, I totally got this. <laughs> I'm the general counsel of this hot Silicon Valley company, for God's sakes. Why wouldn't I have this? The clock, it inches towards the top of the hour. It's time for me to start. The CEO, he takes a seat at the front row. I glance at him. He gives me a slight nod and a smile, and I breathe a little easier. And I begin. My mom is from El Salvador. My dad is from Ecuador. I am Latina. I had never really said those words out loud in the workplace before. All eyes, they were on me. I was shaking and terrified. But I continued anyways, and I told my story that day, this story, for the first time. I was born in Los Angeles, and Spanish was my first language. And we lived in LA until I was around six years old. But my parents, they wanted to give me a better education, so they moved us out of the city and into the suburbs. And they enrolled me in Catholic school. And I suddenly found myself as a little Latina girl in a predominantly white community. And I quickly realized that my customs and my traditions, they were different than everyone else around me. We spoke Spanish at home. Everybody else spoke English. We ate home-cooked meals of arroz con pollo, frijoles y platanos. My friends ate pizza and hamburgers. I celebrated my quinceanera. My friends celebrated their sweet 16. And like most teenagers, I didn't want to be different. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to belong. And my parents, they also wanted to belong. They wanted me to belong. They had thick Spanish am uh, accents, and they suffered from discrimination themselves. They thought my life would be easier and better if people just didn't know where I was from. So they encouraged me, but they assimilate, blend in. So I started speaking English everywhere. And I asked for pizza instead of tamales. And I straightened my hair and lost my curls. And I softened my voice so I wouldn't be the loud Latina in the room. <laughs> and I didn't tell anyone where I was from. I was under the impression that if I was like everyone else in the room, if I just blended into the crowd, things would be easier for me. I would make more friends, I would advance in my career, I would belong. So I tried desperately to fit in, in elementary school, high school, college, law school, and eventually the workplace. But while I thought I was fitting in and succeeding at being more American, something was happening inside. I sl slowly began to lose my sense of self. I didn't feel totally myself with all of my white friends, nor did I feel like I was brown enough to call myself Latina anymore. I had assimilated so much. I soon found myself feeling like I belonged nowhere. So where did I belong? This is the question that I have been grappling with many times through my life and my career. But one particular moment stands out for me, and it happened during my first job as a corporate lawyer. I started my career over the hill in Silicon Valley as a first year corporate associate at a large national corporate law firm. And like many law firms, my firm had large corner offices, mahogany desks, and tall tinted windows. And the firm, it represented some of the oldest companies in the country and some of the hottest Silicon Valley startups. And at the time, the law firm partners, they were mo mostly made up of older white men and everybody was welcoming, but I quickly realized that their lives and my life, they were just different. And at the time, there were also very few women in leadership, especially women of color. And I saw no Latinas in leadership at that law firm. There was nobody that looked like me. So it felt like there was nobody that I could turn to for advice. And as a first generation professional, 
I also didn't have family or friends or a network to show me the ropes. I had to figure out how to have all the rules of the game on my own. So I started doing things that I thought corporate attorneys were supposed to do. I bought some golf clubs. <laughs> <laughs> I even took golf lessons. Uh, but like Erica, I, I thought 18 holes was just too long, so I, I didn't keep playing. I also straightened that naturally curly hair again every single day with a flat iron. And that took me one hour every single morning. And while I quickly mastered the skill of looking like I belonged in that room, I still never really felt like I belonged in that room. When you don't see anyone in the room that looks like you, you feel like an outsider. Everybody else seems to share the same jokes, the same childhood experiences, the same taste in food, but yours, it's different. So what do you do? Well, I stayed quiet, I smiled again, and I went along with it. And as I progressed through that first year at that law firm, I desperately looked for things that felt or sounded familiar to me, but there was just not much I could relate to. And in fact, the only time that I truly felt comfortable in that law firm was at night, when I could put my hair up in my ponytail, kick off my heels, and enjoy my nightly chat with the janitor. A funny thing happens at night. Little by little, people start trickling home and it suddenly becomes quiet. And every evening around 9 p.m., the janitor would come by. And I remember one particular Latino gentleman who would say hello to me every single night. Hola, Jorge, ¿cómo estás esta noche? I remember the first time I said hello to him. He looked surprised that I even spoke to him, especially in Spanish. I'm not sure how many, if any, of the associates ever really talked to him, but I did. He wasn't invisible to me. We would chat for a moment. He would tell me how his night was going, empty my wastebasket, and go on to the next office. But there was something familiar about his voice and his mannerisms that made my body feel relaxed and at ease. He reminded me of home. I would often think about his family since his shift started so late at night. You see, my dad, he also used to work evenings, so he reminded me so much of him. And I admired this janitor for his work ethic and the sacrifices he's made for doing a job that most did not want. And I liked acknowledging him and thanking him every night for keeping our offices so clean. And looking back at those law firm days, I felt more comfortable talking to the janitor than I did to the law firm partners. And that feeling of disconnection, it didn't make sense to me. Why did I not feel comfortable in this corporate space? And as I progressed through my career, I kept trying to answer that question. Where do I belong? I so desperately wanted to be part of this new corporate world I wanted to have that deep sense of belonging. But along the way, as much as I thought I was fitting in, I really wasn't. I often found myself in situations where colleagues would make derogatory comments about immigration, Latinos, affirmative action programs, or diversity mandates, not knowing that they were talking about people like me. And in the workplace, I was often mistaken as the paralegal or the executive assistant, People are always shocked to learn that I was the head of legal or general counsel and now board director and venture investor. I guess I simply don't look the part in their minds. And even on the playground raising my daughters, I was often mistaken as the nanny and not the mother of my beautiful blonde hair, blue eyed daughter. All of these messages that coming in every day from the outside world, they kept saying to me, you don't belong here. And eventually, I started internalizing that. I started believing it. I later learned that I was not alone. I am not the only one that feels like this. A recent study showed that 76% of Latinos downplay or hide their ethnicity at work. 76%. 
But in order to belong, I didn't just hide my ethnicity either. I also hid my pregnancy and my family life when I first had my kids. When I was pregnant with my first daughter, I was working as in-house counsel at a large public software company, and they had an all-male leadership team. And at the time, I didn't see any working moms in leadership, nor working dads for that matter. I mean, yes, there were men that had children, but we only saw their families one time at the annual family barbecue. They never openly talked about that struggle of parenting or those sleepless nights. I was worried that if I talked frankly about the challenges of being a new mother in the workplace, colic, sleep training, struggles with the bottle, that I wouldn't be taken seriously and I would lose credibility with my peers. So I kept that part of my life hidden as well. Having a child is one of the most amazing times in one's life, but I could not share this life event at work. When I finally had to tell my boss that I was pregnant, I couldn't hide it anymore, this was his response. How could you do this to me? <laughs> I've seen this movie, I know how it ends. He walked away and didn't speak to me for a week. I knew that having a baby in this environment wasn't welcomed. So when I returned to work after a three month maternity leave, I now faced a dilemma. Despite weeks and weeks of trying, my daughter refused to take the bottle. She would only nurse, which meant I had to figure out how to nurse my daughter every three hours while at work. These were the days before part-time, flex time, remote time, Zoom. I had to be in the office every day, all day. And there were no employee resource groups, there were no affinity groups, no support and no women in the C-suite who had done it before me to give me advice on how this whole working mom thing was supposed to work. And there were no organizations like this one where I could be around other women who had done it before me. There were also no nursing rooms at the time at my company. So for several weeks, when after I returned to work, I would sneak away every three hours to nurse my baby in the parking garage. And my husband, Derek, some of you know, at the time, he was a stay-at-home dad while he was building his real estate business. So he would bring her to the parking garage until we transitioned her to the bottle. I was the main breadwinner at the time, and we needed our medical benefits, so I was afraid to lose my job. And I was determined to show my boss that this movie would end differently. Nobody knew about this daily exercise. I was afraid that if I asked for accommodations in this environment, or if I revealed that I had to take breaks to nurse my baby in the middle of the day, that I would jeopardize my career. So I kept quiet. I thought this is the only path to success. But what I learned was that it just made me feel lonely, frustrated, and isolated. But the feeling of not belonging, it isn't limited to people from a different gender or race or ethnicity like me it can apply to anyone. You may be somebody who grew up poor or received food stamps and you don't want anybody to know. You might have been adopted or grew up in the foster care system. You might be a single parent who had a child at a very young age or have a child with disabilities. You may be a member of the LGBTQ plus community. You may have a learning difference that you keep hidden. You might struggle with ADHD, anxiety, depression, or another mental health condition. You may be caring for an elderly parent or grieving the loss of a loved one. You may have had a miscarriage or struggling with infertility. Many of us hide different parts of ourselves because we feel we'll be judged, we'll be rejected, not accepted, or just thrown out of the club. We want to belong, it's human nature, 
We don't want to feel like an other. But hiding who you are, changing something about yourself just to fit in, it eventually takes its toll. And while these strategies may work in the short term, and short term may be years or decades like it was for me, this daily exercise becomes emotionally exhausting. And studies have shown that it leads to imposter syndrome, anxiety, depression, and eventually burnout. Studies also show that failing to provide an inclusive workplace can have a dramatic effect on organizations. According to a study by Accenture, US companies are leaving over $1 trillion on the table by not being more inclusive. $1 trillion. And a study published by the Journal of Psychology showed that employees who perceive themselves as authentic showed higher levels of satisfaction at work. So a sense of belonging, it's not only good for our well-being, it's just simply good for business. So after two decades of hiding and trying to change myself to fit in, I decided it was enough. I decided to make a change. No more hiding, no more masks, no more changing. It was time to embrace all of me, even if it didn't please everyone. And I was ready for any potential consequences of that decision. I often get asked a couple of questions. Is it hard to bring your authentic self to work? Or how long does this journey of self-acceptance take? You know, we all want to know. <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer is yes, it may be hard. And yes, it may take some time. Unpacking decades and decades of messages that you're not enough, you don't belong, it's very hard. And like me, you may have put on layers and layers of armor to protect yourself, and letting that guard down is really not easy. It took me years, in fact, but I did it one small step at a time. I started with slowly revealing parts of myself to friends and colleagues in safe spaces. For example, I would bring up my family and relatives, I have over 60 cousins in Ecuador, during conversations at work or with my friends, or I would just speak Spanish in front of other people when the opportunity arose. Or I would openly say, I am leaving early today to attend my daughter's volleyball game instead of saying, I've got that doctor's appointment. And as a manager and a leader, I would block off that first hour on my calendar every morning with the words exercise. So my whole team knew that self-care mattered for us as a group. I was scared at first, but little by little, step by step, it got easier. And I began sharing more and more parts of my story. And to help me on this part of my transformational journey, I put together my own set of tools. And I share many of these tools in my book, but here are a few of them. First, I surrounded myself with people that accepted me just as I am. And I stopped worrying about those that didn't get me. And I leaned on mentors and sponsors to remind me of what I had to offer in the workplace and to provide me with that career roadmap I needed to succeed. And I joined organizations and communities where my lived experience was validated, like women's organizations, where I could spend time and form relationships with people just like me, to be in a place where I could feel seen. So when things got hard, I had people and I had organizations nearby to lift me up. Everybody needs a community to support them on this journey. I cannot stress this enough, and we heard it from the panel today. We need community. You cannot do this alone. And as I transformed and I slowly started showing up more authentically in the workplace, I started to notice a shift. My body began to relax again like it had 25 years earlier when I was talking to that janitor. I started realizing that my gender and my ethnicity and the fact that I was a working parent, it wasn't a liability, 
It's an asset. As a female leader, I know what it feels like to be interrupted, underestimated, and undercompensated. This has led me to be a champion and advocate for equal rights in the workplace. And as a Latina, I see things from a different perspective. I have a unique lived experience that allows me to see others' blind spots, and I have a work ethic like no other. I watched my immigrant parents work multiple jobs to make it in this country. I know what hard work looks like. And as a working parent, I understand the struggles of working families and the importance of policies such as parental leave, flexible work schedules, and the value employees place on family time or self-care. And since I know what it feels like to be an other, I'm a deeply empathetic leader, and this skill was especially helpful during the recent pandemic crisis. So slowly, I not only started believing that I belonged in that room, but that the room it actually needs me in it. That my unique lived experience was actually my superpower. And understanding that is what gave me courage to show up that day at Looker, stand in front of hundreds of my colleagues, and tell my story. My mom is from El Salvador. My dad is from Ecuador. I am Latina. And once I started telling my story that day, all my fears, they started melting away. Where I once worried that some might think I was just calling myself Latina now to take advantage of the DEI movement, I didn't give that concern a second thought. Where I once worried that I'd be snubbed by my colleagues for not being enough, now all I saw was a sea of welcoming faces. And at one point during the conversation at Looker, I paused and I looked around the room. There was complete silence. Nobody was checking their phones and all eyes were fixed on me. Everybody was paying attention. Heads were nodding. Some were wiping away tears. And after the presentation, a line formed. I got lots of hugs of support, but I distinctly remember one employee in particular. She was a young Latina, maybe in her mid-20s, and she came up to me and she just broke down in tears. She said, I just want to say thank you. I have never seen anyone in leadership that looked like me until now. I know exactly how you feel because that's how I feel. Your story is my story. I stood there frozen. Suddenly, all those fears of telling my story and the repercussions all just disappeared. I realized that by being vulnerable and sharing my story, I helped her. It was all worth it. That was my legacy. I did not realize what a profound impact telling my story would have on any one person. In that moment, I flashed back to those days at that law firm when I saw no one that looked like me and how lonely that felt. I thought about all the times that I hidden details about my background as a Latina and as a working mom and what a disservice that was for all the others that came behind me. On that day, showing up as my true self, it gave permission for others at my company to show up as their true selves as well. I learned that by being authentic in the workplace, it wasn't just about me. It was bigger than me. I needed to be that leader that I never saw when I started my career, that person that just shows up unabashedly as themselves. We are all different. We come from different races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, religions, backgrounds, and lived experiences. And for some of you in the room, you may have had a sense of belonging your whole life. You grew up in a stable home. You were cherished for who you are. You were rewarded for taking risks. This is truly a gift. Take a moment to appreciate this part of who you are. For others of you, like me, 
Your journey may have been a little different. It may have looked a little bit like mine or it may have been different in other ways. A different race, a different language, a different religion, a different economic status. Or you may find yourself as the first or the few or the only in the room. There are so many reasons why we may feel like an other in the room. But no matter which person you are sitting here today, you both have power. For those of you who have a solid sense of belonging, you have a very important role. You can be the voice to the voiceless. You can pass the mic to those that continuously get ignored. You can be the advocate and the sponsor for that high potential employee that just keeps getting passed over. We need you to step into your power and be our allies, and not just in words, but in real action. Actively interrupt bias when you see it or when you hear it, and sponsor someone from behind the scenes. Actively advocate to see more representation in leadership. We need you to use your power and influence to create more spaces of belonging so that all of us can come into the room feeling safe. And for those of you, like me, who are walking into that room, maybe questioning whether they belong there, I'm here to tell you, yes, you absolutely belong in that room. It is no mistake. And yes, you have power too. You may feel scared or anxious or even doubtful in the moment. You may have imposter syndrome and still not even believe that you deserve the role, the position, or success you've achieved to date. But here's the secret. You deserve it. You're enough. And your background and your lived experience, no matter how different or difficult it may have been, it's exactly what this world needs right now. That experience of feeling like an other, it gives you a unique perspective that others just don't have. You see blind spots others just don't see. And you have a deep sense of empathy that makes you an incredible leader. It is now your turn to be unabashedly visible in the world, to be the leader you wish you saw, to bring the whole you into the room so that generations behind us have permission to do it as well. It's time for all of us to tell our stories, to learn from each other, to realize that we are all more alike than we are different. And if all of us do our part, then maybe one day when my kids or the next generation, they walk into that first job, they don't have to wonder whether they belong in that room. They just know that they do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share my story and be vulnerable with you. Um, we have some time left to answer some questions and do q and I think Amy has the mic and um, yeah, I'm an open book, as you can tell, so <laughs> you can ask me anything. Hi, Trisha. Hi. I just want to say thank you, um, and, and, I'll, and I might cry, um, because you told my story. Um, I was the only black person in law school, and even though law school was hard enough, being the only black person in law school made it triply hard. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, it and you also remind me about the, um, I, I go to a lot of legal events locally, and even today when I was getting dressed, I don't wear black pants and white shirts anymore because any time I went to a legal event, everybody thought I was the help. Yeah. Yeah. And like this morning when I got dressed to come here, I had to tell myself, don't wear a white shirt because I want people to think I'm the help. Yeah. And so thank you for speaking that out loud because people have no idea mm -hmm. that even just trying to have to get dressed a certain way so people don't think we're the higher help, yeah. that people don't think that I'm not good enough to go to law school. Yeah. And guess what, y'all? I graduated too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
they, 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 don't, they don't know that, that struggle, and it's a struggle. And yes, we could do what we, we can to take good care of ourselves. And I want to tell you all, it's real. Mm -hmm. It's really real. So, um, you know, getting dressed may be a privilege, but it's not for everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much, and thank you for being part of the DEI committee and forming one, and that's an incredible first start. I think having these really hard conversations um, is, is a good start, and um, I would just say continue to be curious, you know, learn, bring in um, speakers from all diverse perspectives. I really do believe in the power of storytelling because, you know, you can be sitting next to a colleague and not know you know, their lived experience, um, and you've been working them f with them for years. Um, so by bringing in, um, you know, trainers and, and, and others uh, to share their lived experience, we learn from each other, and we can um, then see what other potential, you know, lived experiences are like. Um, it was funny, at one, um, uh, there was a colleague that I used to work with years ago that started at the law firm with me, and he's a white guy, and he read my book and he said, you know, you and I have had the same career tra trajectory on paper. We've done all the things, you know, it looks exactly the same, but my path was so easy. And I didn't, and I, because my path was so easy, I thought everybody's path was easy. And so it was an aha moment for him to recognize that, wow, you know, just because things are easy for me, or just because people treat me a certain way, it doesn't mean that they treat everybody that same way. And I learned that lesson too, um, about that unconsciously people treat people differently. And so when somebody, a person of color tells you, I'm not being treated well, listen. Mm 